and the appeal. I'm Alana Sivan. In 2006, Anissa Jordan was sentenced to life in prison for a murder that she was never even accused of committing. And there was a story about this in The Atlantic by Lara Bazelon where she described how she got involved in the incident that ended up in her being convicted of this murder. She met a man who promised to give her the world if she did just one thing for him. And that was to engage in a string of robberies in San Francisco. And so Jordan and this man and another woman drove from Oakland to San Francisco. And the plan was that the two women would distract people who were walking by and the man would come and rob them of their belongings. Now, the first robbery went without incident. Jordan, after that robbery, went back to the car to stash a necklace. She's in the car and while she's there, she hears a gunshot. And while she was in the car, away from the scene, the other two had engaged in a robbery that went wrong. The man who was the victim of that robbery, engaged, there was a struggle. And the boyfriend of Jordan ended up shooting this man and killing him. Now, a short time later, the police arrested all three of these individuals and charged them with first degree murder. Prosecutors all agreed, by the way, that the story that I just told you is exactly what happened, that Jordan was not actually involved in this murder. But because California had something called the felony murder law, she was charged with murder simply for being part of a plot that ultimately resulted in death, even though this was not her intention, even though she was not there, and even though this was none of her fault. And even though, despite all of these circumstances, a jury agreed and sentenced Jordan to 27 years to life in prison, leaving her four children without a mother. Now, Jordan then spent the next 12 plus years in prison for a murder that again, was not her fault. But in August of 2018, SB 1437 passed and gave her a second chance at freedom. And Senate Bill 1437 said that you cannot be sentenced to first degree murder if you did not commit the murder. If you did not have the intention to kill and did not participate directly in the killing, you should not be charged with murder. Um, and it got rid of murder charges also in cases in which death could be considered a natural and probable consequence of the crime. And so as a result of this, Jordan was able to go back to a judge who was able to resentence her case to five years, which was for the robbery that she committed, not for the murder that she did not. Um, and so, so many people were able to benefit from this law. Um, but there was also another big problem in the criminal legal system, which was that there were people, or there still are people to this day, who face life sentences, or excuse me, death or life without parole in the so-called felony murder special circumstance cases. Um, under current California law, anyone who is convicted of a felony murder involving one of these special circumstances faces a mandatory sentence of death or life without parole, even if they didn't intend to kill anyone or intend for anyone to die. So think of the example above. If there was a special circumstance in that case, which our guests will describe to us exactly what that means in a little bit, everything would change. Jordan would not be able to benefit from SB 1437. And on top of that, a judge could not consider whether to give her anything less than death or life without parole. Um, and But there is a new Senate bill, SB 300, which would return discretion to judges in those cases. It would allow a judge to look at all of the facts of the case to decide whether or not justice would be better served by a less extreme sentence. Uh, it would also, like SB 1437, would grant individuals incarcerated under old laws the opportunity to be able to go back to a judge to petition for resentencing. So for more on SB 300, I am so pleased today to be joined by our two very special guests. We have Senator David Cortezzi, 
the bill's sponsor, and Joanne Shear, founder and director of the Felony Murder Elimination Project, and the mother of a child who is currently serving a sentence of life without parole on felony murder special circumstance charge. And they're both going to talk to us about the importance of SB 300. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm going to start out by asking Senator Cortezzi, um, uh, talk to us a little bit about SB 300 in your own words. What does the legislation do and why is it necessary to the movement to reform felony murder in California? Well, thank you, Alana. Thank you. Thanks again for the invitation to be here. I appreciate it very much. And it's um, great that Joanne is here with us because uh, she's got a very clear understanding of, of what's going wrong uh, with special circumstances, felony murder. Um, you know, it, it's, I'm an attorney <laughs> and I used to at one time uh, some years ago practice, you know, private criminal defense for a few years. So it's hard for me to to speak sometimes in just purely lay person's terms, but it also helps me understand very much how the system gets skewed um, uh, and, and, and why it has flaws um, and why those flaws need to be um, unraveled or turned around um, or corrected. Um, in this case, if you kind of work backwards, um, and this is something that, um, you know, even a constitutional law expert would tell you, when you look at the outcomes of felony murder special circumstances, um, you can see almost immediately that it's a racist, it's a racist law. Um, there's two ways to arrive at a racist law. One of them is on its face, right? In other words, somebody just says, um, nobody of this color or this race or this ethnicity can eat at the lunch counter. Um, that would be on its face a racist law. And certainly we've had those in this country. Another way that you determine that a law is racist is um, not so much because it was put together with imp uh, explicit or express racist terminology, but because after it's been enacted into law, you look at the results of it and it has de facto or actual uh, racist implications. And that's what's happened here. And that's what should make, um, you know, our effort with SB 300 very compelling to my colleagues in the legislature. Uh, if you look at, at the numbers of uh, what's going on is uh, that we have about 68% um, of those who have been convicted of life without parole or felony or, or uh, the death penalty, as you just indicated, about 68% of them uh, are Latino or, or Blacks in, in California. So uh, to make that worse, um, two thirds of them or more are under the age of 25. Uh, and the average age of those convicted is 19 years old. So you can see the result of this law is not that much different than the results of the Southern strategy, um, you know, that uh, uh, conservatives put in place to try to, you know, get people um, out of the picture uh, at a young age, hang a felony on them, not only hang a felony on them, but if, if possible, incarcerate them, literally get them uh, out of, of society. And you would, one would think, you know, that a lot of that which would have changed by now, a lot of it has changed, but as we know, uh, and has become abundantly clear, particularly over the last couple of years with uh, the resurgence of of um, the justice movement, the racial justice movement, uh, we can see, um, I think even more clearly than ever, that uh, there's been a continuation of that kind of thinking and the outcomes of this particular law um, as to young people, but as particularly as to people of color is um, skewed um, extraordinarily <laughs> in, um, against any kind of, of fairness or proportionality um, the bottom line is there is such a thing as transferred felony murder intent if you're a lawyer. I mean, it is possible. And nobody is trying to get rid of that concept with, with this bill and 1437 didn't try to do that either. But there is such a thing. I mean, if you, you can't just use as a defense, oh, geez, you know, I didn't really mean to kill the person. I was just, you know, trying to beat them up badly or... I was just trying to give them a nice, um, 
joyful <laughs> jump out of a 10 story window. I mean, you can't, you can't say that um, I didn't have the intent uh, just as some kind of a fiction in your mind. Um, so the law has to be clear about that. This goes way too far. And it does, uh, Alana, what you were talking about, it basically says, you know, anyone by who by any factual stretch can be identified as an accomplice, an accomplice uh, to someone who did have uh, that, that felony intent, uh, that homicidal intent at some point, or even the negligent homicidal intent, that person is going to be, um, is not only going to be implicated in that same intent, but where things really go wrong <laughs> is that the law now says that if that's charged by the district attorney, what I just described, what you just described, you were in the car, somebody had felony intent, you're going to have it too, but the judge has no right or opportunity to sentence you, the so-called accomplice, to anything other than the death penalty or life without parole. Um, that's not only way over the top, but it's way over the top with these racist implications that we've just seen in outcomes. So that's what's going on. The best argument for this bill is if you really want a justice movement, particularly a racial justice movement, then we need to start dismantling racist laws that are on the books right now. And um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick to that, and hopefully, we'll get the votes on SB 300. So, thank you for that explanation. And I will say that you know I'm a lawyer myself, and looking at sort of the difference between these two laws, I'm very confused. Um, or it took a while for me to get it. And I also I actually think that somebody who's experienced it directly um, can can probably give a really good explanation. So to do that, Joanne, I'd love to turn to you. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about your own experience with California's felony murder law and, and how that led you to the conclusion that um, it needed to be take, taken off the books Thank and you. how it looks in practice too. Okay, thank you, uh, Senator Cortese and thank you, Alana. Um, so I, I've got an only child um, and he was 20 years old at uh, he had, he had joined the Marine Corps. He was 20 years old um, when he joined the Marine Corps, just turned 20. Um, he, uh, he had sold his laptop uh, to an acquaintance of uh, another young man in the Marine Corps. And um, I'm sorry, I get very emotional when, when I talk about this. Tony was a sweet kid. Um, he was very, very, um, uh, took people at face value. Um, he was friendly to everybody um, and he had never been in trouble. But when he joined the Marine Corps, he, he didn't, you know, it was right after high school and he didn't know where, what, what to do with his life. So he joined the Marine Corps. Um, while he was there, um, he used to come home every weekend. Um, he used to drive home, which takes money. So uh, he wanted to come home one weekend and he sold his laptop computer to uh, an acquaintance um, who never paid him for it. So a couple of weeks later, um, he, he went with another couple of Marines to uh, a couple of the guys after a day of drinking and watching football, they decided to go and get the laptop, go and pick up the laptop. So uh, unfortunately, uh, because of that very quick decision, when they went to pick up the laptop, um, one of the Marines that they were with had suffered a, um, a severe brain injury in, in his tour in Iraq. And what it did was it, um, he lost the right frontal lobe and which is the executive functioning of your brain. It, it has to do with remorse. It has to do with uh, consciousness. So uh, anyway, there was an argument that broke out and this young Marine pulled a gun and shot this young man. Unbeknownst to Tony, my son, who was an unbeknownst to the other young man that was there, they were shocked and horrified that 
somebody could do such a thing. That was not the plan. The plan was just to pick up my son's computer. Um, I got a phone call. Um, a couple. I, I knew nothing about this and I didn't know anything about this until I got a phone call from the police department saying that my son was picked up and I asked why he was picked up, what he would, he's never been in trouble before in his life. And she very, um, with this kind of gleeful little um, remark said, oh, he's been picked up for murder. And um, that was the beginning of, of like a living hell. Um, he was in, he was in jail for, in county jail for about almost two years. And he was, uh, along with the other two, uh, charged, convicted, and, um, and charged and convicted of felony murder special circumstances. He did not kill anyone. He did not have any intent to kill anyone. The plan wasn't to kill anyone. The plan was just to go and pick up a laptop computer. And uh, he and, and the other two are now serving life without the possibility of parole. I, I wanna be very clear when I say that life without parole is a death sentence. They will not get out. There's no way of ever getting out. There's no parole board. There's no chance to go before the parole board. You, the only way you're getting out of prison is in a casket and that's it. There's no other choice. You can appeal, but appeals, uh, felony murder is so, um, is so airtight in, in California that there's no other way. SB 1437 was amazing. And um, it has afforded a lot of people the opportunity to come to, to be resentenced as they should since they did not commit a murder. Um, but if you are charged with special circumstances in California, there are, they, they sound like special, they sound like very um, not a big deal, but all they are is, is there are actually 37 different circumstances that you can be charged with that will give you that mandate a death penalty or death by incarceration, life without parole. This felony murder um, special circumstance uh, is, is um, for is 13 of those. There are 13 felonies that qualify for this. Robbery is one, burglary is one, train wrecking is one. Um, but the difference between uh, Tony, somebody like Tony and somebody who has, who um, was an accomplice in a 1437 is a prosecutor's discretion. A prosecutor is the only one that gets to, to decide whether he is going to charge a special circumstance. And that really is a lot of, there's no crime that mandates a charge of special circumstance. So the only difference between someone else in this situation and my son who's serving, and my son along with 5,100 people, who are serving life without parole under felony murder special circumstances is simply the decision made by a prosecutor. So I know, first of all, thank you so much for sharing your story. I know that's not easy to do here and we really appreciate you doing that because it's important. Um, and I also, it, you know, there are so many people right now who are against SB 300, unfortunately, um, who have said that it's necessary in order to deter crime. Now, the story you've just told us would probably show us precisely the opposite. Um, so could you talk a little bit about what you would say to those, to those folks who are, who are saying that we need these felony murder laws in order to act as deterrence? Um, deterring a crime means that you know the ramifications of a crime. Right. So if you're if, if you've never had the uh, if you've never had the um, if you've never been in a situation where you've where you've thought about doing a crime, um, then then you don't know the ramifications of a crime. Right. If you're not setting about setting up to do a crime, for instance, you don't know the ramifications. If you do set up to do a crime, then you probably know the ramifications. Right. If you go to to steal something, then there's there's a, a price to be paid for that. However, um, life without parole, this kind of, of sentence and this 
um, nobody knows what felony murder is. They, this felony murder has been on the books for 150 years since the inception of California. And if you don't know what that is, then you don't know that, that you're going to be charged and possibly have a lifetime in prison. You don't know that. We're, the public doesn't know about life without parole or special circumstances. You said at the beginning of the show that it was hard for you, even as a lawyer, to understand the difference. As people, as regular people out here in the community who have nothing to do with the law, um, we don't, we, we are far from understanding those ramifications, right? So it doesn't deter crime. Uh, long prison sentences do not deter crime. Not only do they not deter crime, they don't make the public any safer because they, it's, it, it, the, the, um, the knowledge of this kind of ramification, this kind of consequence is not known. By, by a normal person. Because you can't be deterred from doing something that you're not sure if you are allowed to do precisely. Um, Senator, talk to us about where this bill is right now. Um, what are the conversations happening? What's the likelihood of passage? What's the next step in terms of its passage? Well, the, um, the, the bills, all bills now that we're we're past the bill deadline will be assigned by the Senate Rules Committee. This is, you know, a Senate bill um, to uh, the pro appropriate policy committee, and then they'll be heard by that policy committee. There's basically only two hearings now, in part because of COVID. There's a somewhat of a limitation on, you know, the legislative process. Um, there's a lot of bills that have been introduced, so uh, the math on that has determined to some degree that. You know, the hearing process is a little limited. I, it isn't a bad thing. And by the way, um, those committee hearings uh, that will be coming up uh, on the bill, this, uh, the committee hearing on this bill has not been set yet, but as soon as it's set, of course, we'll get that information out. And, and I started to say, by the way, um, members of the public can, um, can call in. I mean, one of the advantages, uh, kind of a silver lining, I suppose, if you will, of having the capital uh, pretty shut down because of the pandemic is, um, you know, the meetings that are attended, these committee meetings are still live. Uh, I will, you know, be there testifying. The committee members will be there, um, but the public can just um, call in. You don't have to trek all the way to the Capitol. So uh, I would hope there'd be, you know, some significant testimony in favor of the bill because this, this bill is really about fair, fair treatment for the public. And um, Where do people go, by the way, to be able to get updates on when that hearing is and when they can sign up and, and sign up to testify? Yeah, the um, the best place to go is um, is to the Senate um, uh, the Senate website because that website will take you into a, a legislative portal where you can track um, all of the bills. And um, if you just Google that or go to senate.ca.gov, you'll get right in and then you can uh, just find the legislative portal link. I, I don't have that exact website with me um, or that exact link. Otherwise I would put it in the, in the chat room right now, but it's easy enough to find. Um, and you're always willing, uh, always uh, of course, welcome to, to email me directly at senator.cortese, C-O-R-T-E-S-E, at sen.ca.gov if you're just for any reason but if, particularly if you're just interested in finding out hey, has that hearing been set when can i testify when can, who can i send an email to um that, that would help us communicate with each other uh, and, and of course after committee it's got it's, it's got to go to the senate for it's got to go to the uh, to the other house the assembly it's got to be heard there um, it's got to come back if there's any amendments and, and ultimately it's got to be signed by the governor. But uh, I, I don't think philosophically there'll be as much of an issue as, um, you know, just making sure that people understand exactly what we're doing here. We keep circling back to this fact that do people really understand, perhaps even some of my colleagues or legislators uh, in the assembly, do they really understand what we're getting at here? And we really are attacking the sentencing at this point. It's, it's a sentencing issue in this bill. Um, and we need people to understand that there's a lot of good policy and law right now about 
moving away from incarceration, uh, frankly, about uh, moving away from traditional parole and, and you know, using reentry centers and things like that. Um, there's a lot of um, talk about closing prisons. We got two um, lined up to be closed right now. Those are all important issues. Those are things that I generally support. We want to make sure people understand this is a sentencing bill. It's not, <laughs> we don't want to get caught up in the hysteria about are you putting people back on the streets? Um, deterrent is, you know, is not in and of itself problematic, but you don't need LWAP, life without parole or the death penalty to deter somebody from doing a crime. You know? Especially when we've seen how these, you know, how life without parole so disproportionately affects people of color in this country and in California. Um, and that's something that, that you spoke a little bit about at the beginning, but also um, Joanna, it's something that you've spoken publicly about a lot of those sorts of trends when it comes to the racial disparities in California's fel felony murder law. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to kick our last question to you. Could you share with us some of what you've seen behind prison walls that illustrates that point? Um, so when I started going to county jail and prison, um, it, it was it was stunning to me to see the amount of um, just the amount of people of color who are um, who are affected by this. Um, it, it, sitting in a room with so many children um, and their parents, right, who are incarcerated, it was it was just horrifying to me. It almost felt like um, uh, it almost felt like an old movie um, back from from you know years ago when when we, it just feels like Jim Crow to me. It feels like we have not, we have gone from the fields to taking them from the fields to putting them in prison, whether they're African-American, whether they're Latinx, whether they're Asian, whether they're, there's so much um, racial disparity in prison uh, that, that it was stunning to me, but, but racial disparity, particularly in extreme sentencing, like um, death in prison, like like life without par uh, parole, um, because th this happens, um, people cannot afford lawyers when you are um, living in um, in areas that are impoverished, and you you can't afford like top notch lawyers to uh, for your for your children. Um, and so without those lawyers, without that legal help, without somebody to stand up and speak out, there people are dying in prison that should not be dying in prison. I just want to add that on average in California, 130 people a year, mostly kids between the ages of 18 and 25, are sentenced to death by incarceration. That's one person every three days in California for a death that they did not commit. Mm -hmm. No one deserves to die. No family deserves this living hell for the action of another. And if it can happen to my son, it can happen to anybody. And anybody who thinks that it cannot uh, really needs to take a look at this law and they need to call their legislator. Thank you so much, both of you for, for coming here, for sharing your experiences and and for fighting the good fight. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Alana. Thank Appreciate you, Senator Katezi. Thank you, Joanne. Mm -hmm. So justice reform is, is once on the move again in California. We saw a few years ago how state lawmakers took the much needed action of passing SB 1437, reforming the state's felony murder law, which made it so that people who did not kill people and did not have knowledge that a killing took place could be that those folks could not be sentenced to the same people who actually committed the crime. This seems like a common sense thing to do. Um, and that reform also applied retroactively, which gave so many people who had been sentenced to absurdly harsh sentences, a chance at freedom and relief. Um, but SB 1437 did not fix the problem. As Joanne just told us, her son right now is serving time in prison, is essentially sentenced to death by incarceration for his involvement in a killing that 
he did not commit, that he had no knowledge of it all and that he couldn't have imagined would even happen. Um, and this is because of the state's fel felony murder special circumstance law that mandates the state to take his life, that gives the state no other choice to take a person's life either by the death penalty or death by incarceration. Even though he committed no violence, even though he maintained that he never knew the victim could be killed. Um, but despite all those things, right now her son is facing this particularly harsh sentence. And it's not just affecting him, it's also affecting the people in his life who love him and who are fighting for him on the outside. SB 300 would take these extreme punishments off the table entirely. Um, it would give, or I'm sorry, wouldn't take these extreme punishments off the table entirely, but it would give the judges the chance to say that this isn't the right solution. It would give judges the chance to say, let's look at all of the facts and let's determine a more appropriate sentence for this person given their involvement or non-involvement in the crime. And that is what is truly in the best interest of justice. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Alana Sivan. You can continue to watch the latest news on the Appeal Live on Facebook and Twitter.